we have Mitch O'Reilly talking about categories of optics. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and thank you to Brendan for inviting me along. Uh, very excited. So today, I'd like to relay to you a particular perspective on lenses and, in general, other kinds of optics which we're using Haskell programming and bidirectional programming, uh, which I think is very clarifying and sort of maybe justifies why lenses look like the way they do and why they have the laws that they do. Uh, so uh, I saw that David gave a talk last week with lenses in the title, but just in case I'll, I'll define again for you uh, what we're talking about. So, a lens from S to A is a pair of maps. Get from S to A, the other which is called put from S plus A to S. Okay. So these are used a lot by Haskell programmers in, in particular as data accesses. So if we think about S here, say, as the record of a person's information and A as their first name, something like that. Given the record of a person's information, we can pull up their first name, and if we need to make a correction, if we have a record and a new first name, we can update the first name inside the record. And uh, but lenses have shown up in a bunch of other places as well, in particular in uh, Brendan and David's work on their category of learners. And there's also some work done by a fellow called Jules Hedges in Oxford, where he um, where they somehow show up in game theory. Uh, and so when we use lenses uh, in Haskell, we're using them from, and from the engineering perspective, uh, we often want them to satisfy certain conditions, uh, conditions that are known as the lens balls. So I'm going to say a lens is lawful if the following three things hold. These have kind of goofy names. We've got get put. And so what this says is if we have an S and we pull out the A, so keep S the same, and use get to get an A. And then we put the A that we got out straight back in. This is supposed to be just the identity on S. So that's the first law. The second law is put get. So this is more or less doing things the other way. If we put an A into an S, and then we get the A straight back out again, what this should be is just projection to the A component. It shouldn't do anything. This is supposed to be just projection to the A component. And finally, we have this law called put put, which is a little bit more difficult to describe. Maybe slightly. And the idea uh, with put put is that when we make updates to the A inside of an S, any update that we make should completely overwrite previous ones that we do. So uh, if we have an S and two A's, we could put the first one. We could put the first one. In. We get this, and then put the second one. <coughs> Or alternatively, we could just completely forget about the first one. So I'm just going to write that as like projection to the first and the third thing to get an S cross A. Uh, and then just put the second thing in. And then the put put law just claims that this continues. It's the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Haskell programmers usually want their lenses. Uh, to satisfy the lens laws. I think they're not happy if they don't. But the bidirectional programming people, I think, uh, pick and choose which laws they're interested in in uh, given situations. So uh, as an example of a lawful lens, the, the thing that I said over here about projecting a field out of a record is lawful in general. Uh, if we, you know, if we uh, project and then put it back in, we haven't changed anything, and you know, it sort of makes sense that it's true. Uh, but as an example of a lens which uh, is useful but not lawful in this sense. 
uh, the, the bidirectional program people talk about uh, like lenses that sort of count the number of changes which a field has undergone. So uh, anytime we change the first name, maybe we increment a counter or something like that. So get put, if we get something out and put it back in, and we haven't changed the name, we don't increment the counter. If we put something in and reject it out, it's still by two. But now put put doesn't hold, because if we change the name twice, we've incremented the counter twice rather than once. And uh, this is something that they care just as an example of um, why we might be interested in lenses that aren't lawful. Okay. So this is the applied category theory seminar. So it shouldn't be surprising that lenses form a category. And uh, waffle lenses a subcategory of all lenses. Okay, and I won't um, I won't go through how we compose these things, but if you have a collection of two composable lenses, it's it's not too hard to fit the pieces together into a composite lens. Like get in particular is really obvious, you just compose the two get functions, and it's only slightly more difficult for it to put. Okay, so these are the things that I'm uh, going to try and generalize for you in this talk. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons we might want to do that. Um, first of all, the, the definition of lens, and in particular the laws that we want, feel to me a little bit ad hoc, in the sense that we have this sort of strange shape of maps that we can compose in you know, the only way that we can, but in particular these things seem like they're justified just by what is like, practical to program with, rather than having some uh, underlying reason for them. And, uh, but it turns out that uh, lenses and their laws are exactly examples of this optic construction uh, and I'm going to show that uh, when we apply the optic construction to a category of products, we exactly get our lenses and their laws. And the, the nice symmetrical form which optics are going to take involve uh, what's called a coend. And so I'm going to spend some time in this talk giving a, a crash course in the calculus of ends and coends, uh, in particular because I think they're really cool and let you do calculation, very uh, powerful calculations very quickly. Hopefully it's not reviewed for too many of these. Okay. So, that was one. Let's go to... Okay, so ends and coins are a particular shape of limit and colimit. But I'm not going to describe them that as that uh, immediately because that kind of obscures what the universal property that we want is. Uh, so I'm going to kind of replicate the normal definition that we have for limits except change the shape of things. So when we define a limit, we define what it means to be a cone over a functor, and then the, the limit is a terminal cone. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing here except with a different shape and different names for things. The first thing I'm going to define is the variant of a cone which we want, which is called a wedge. So we can ask about the limit of any functor, but ends and coins only apply to functors of a particular shape. So suppose we have a functor which uh, is of this shape. It's from C up across C to D. Okay, suppose this is wedge, we are version of a cone, with apex D is a family of maps. From D, I'll give it a name, alpha C goes from D into P applied to the same C in both components. This is the first important difference. If we were just taking an ordinary limit, we would need a family of maps when these things are not necessarily the same. Uh, okay. So a wedge is a family of maps of these things, uh, but we also need some compatibility between them. And what shape could that compatibility take? Well, 
uh, like a cone, let's suppose we've got uh, some morphism in C. So we've got from C to C prime. And let's try and draw a commutative diagram. So we could use our wedge to go from D to P of C and C. Or we could go somewhere else to C prime. And using this function, uh, using this morphism, we can close this diagram up. So in this one, in the covariant position, we can use the morphism to head down to P of C and C prime. But now over here, we can use the contravariant position to go backwards to C. So we do get a square. Using F in the first one. Okay, so this is going to be, uh, this is our definition of the branch. And then end of our functor is a terminal branch. So, uh, I mean, just as with a limit, I'm not going to uh, waste time uh, you know, writing everything out, but by terminal wedge, I mean that every other wedge factors uniquely through um, the chosen universal one. Okay, so these, uh, these things called ends have a sort of funny notation. Um, uh, they're, they're written with an integral sign. So, the end is written with the uh, variable on the bottom. It's the integral of c of b of c. Okay, so these things are a little bit hard to get uh, a handle on. Uh, but the way that I like to think about them is uh, ends and coends are categorical versions of for all and exists. I, I don't mean that in a formal way, it's just an intuition. So, uh, we have this proposition as our first example of an end. Let's suppose we've got two ordinary factors from C to D. Between small factors. We're going to calculate the following end. We're going to take the end over C of maps from F of C to G of C. Now, if we're thinking about ends as for all, this is asking for for all C's, we want a map from F of C to G of C in some compatible way. And that sounds kind of familiar. Uh, we might expect such a thing to be a natural transformation. And with D, this end is exactly equal to the set of natural transformations from F to G. So, uh, I mean, how, how might we think about this? Well, let's think about a cone over this functor in here. And to make things even simpler, let's think about just a cone with apex, just a terminal object in the sense. So what is this saying? We have a map, we have a map from the terminal object to each of these sets here. In other words, we're picking out for each C a map from F of C to G of C. And this diagram is asking for some kind of compatibility. It's saying the map that we choose for C, if we post-compose by something, it's the same as the, the map we choose for C prime, and then pre-composing by that same thing. And this is exactly naturality. So in other words, uh, our apex with um, our wedge with apex the terminal object is picking out a natural transformation, in other words, it's factoring through this thing. And in the general case of just a, some other set is the same thing. So to be clear, the D here is set and the C of the D, I think, or something, right? D, uh, uh, from here to here. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm no, no problem. Just yeah, I should in case people were unclear. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
So the variable here is ranging over uh, C, uh, C's, and the target of this functor is sets. So this, in this case, the P is from C up cross C to set. Great, thanks. thing I want to point out is that we can express ends and cones in terms of ordinary limits and cones. Oh, I didn't tell you what a cone was. So, uh, it's, I mean, it's just a dual thing, but I really should just write on the board. So, um, we have cone wedges. Also written with an integral notation, but this time with the variable on the top of the integral sign. Oh, so we can describe ends and coins as ordinary limits and coordinates in the following way. these two maps, well, the, the map into the component of F looks, uh, for one of the maps, looks at the component of C and then postcomposes, and the other map looks at the component of C prime and precomposes. So uh, this equalizer definition, uh, this equalizer that we've got written here is really just repackaging the uh, the universal property which we described over here, because this equalizer here is the universal object with a map to all of the P of C and C, but such that the this diagram can be used basically. So we've written this, um, so we can describe the ends of this. And just to complete this off, the comment is the co equalizer of the diagram facing the way. Product over all of the maps. So th this this uh, description is really useful when we're interested in actually computing explicitly an end or a cohen. Uh, and we're going to use this description down here to go from the cohen description of an optic to something which is easier to get our hands on. So, all right. As uh, an immediate corollary of writing out ends and coins as limits and coins. We have that these things are preserved by the home functor. So if we look at the maps out of the code end into some generic object, this is the same thing as taking the end over all the maps. Dually, if we're looking at the maps into an end, it's the same thing as the end of all the maps. And 
and so the co here becomes end just because the, we're in the contravariant place. Okay, so all of these uh, things here were kind of set up for the tool which is going to let us describe the lenses of Cohen's, which is the following proposition. Which I have seen called the ninja unit. Oh, sometimes called unit reduction. This lets us uh, get rid of Cohen's in a particular situation. So let's suppose we've got the input for the unit lemma. We've got some um, difference dot set. The ninja, the ninja unita lemma says we can make the following calculation. The value of the functor, that's on x, is the same thing as the following kind. f of c plus c. And uh, this thing is a little odd. There's, there's one thing that I like to think of, which is when we take f to be a simplicial set, let's say. So, in the case of simplicial sets, let's suppose we Sorry, was there supposed to be an x on the right-hand side? Yeah. Oh, yes. Definitely. <laughs> in the case of the simplicial set, uh, here we might, this would be calculating well, that's, we're interested in all of the simplices of a particular dimension. So then that's the Cohen that looks like this. And I mean, the way I think about this is uh, we're taking, uh, we're looking at all of the simplices of every dimension. Uh, and simplices of very high dimension are going to have lots of faces of dimension n, right? So we've counted these simplices many times. But the current here is doing exactly the gluing which is required to identify a whole bunch of those simplices which are being counted many times. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that helps, but that's a nice example of it. And in the Haskell world, they call this the continuation passing transfer. And I don't want to try and improvise, improvise explaining that. I'm sure some of the new audience knows it better than I do. Okay. So I want to prove this because it uses all of the pieces that we've seen so far. we're going to look at the maps out of the right-hand side of that isomorphism and try and simplify it. So let's start with maps. Let's so let's uh, look at all of these maps into some set. So the first thing we can do is we can apply this Corollary that to pull the comment outside, turning it into an end. So we're taking the end over C of C plus the maps from this to C into Y. Okay. Next step. The category set is Cartesian closed. So we can move this piece into the other side of the home. So on the left hand side, we're left with this bit. And on the right hand side, uh, we have the maps inset from f of c to y. Right. Okay. 
So now this end that we're calculating here is exactly an instance of this example way back from the start, right? We're looking, we're taking the end over all of the maps from a functor applied to the object to a functor, some other functor applied to the same object. So in other words, this set here is the set of natural transformations from the functors that are left. Uh, so C the maps from X to dash and the maps from F dash to Y. Alright. Now maybe you see what happens next. We're now looking at all of the natural transformations out of a representative functor. So at this point we apply the ordinary natal lemma. And what do we get? We get this functor on the right applied to x. So set of f of x to y. So now we've shown that all of the maps from this thing into y are naturally isomorphic to all of the maps from this thing to y. So again, using the United lemma, the two things are isomorphic. Before I move on from this, I should say that the, the isomorphism, if we trace through the isomorphisms here, the isomorphism that we get over here is very easy to describe. So we got f of x here. To uh, this thing is kind of like a. You know, we have to think back to the, the description as a co-equalizer. We can include this thing into this component here, and then we need to provide a map from. Um, well, this thing is now f of x. We need to provide a map from x to itself, and it's easy to do that. And in the other direction, suppose we've got some w and an f over here. If this is just an f of c, but we have a map from x to c, then we can use the functor f to go backwards. So functor f applied to f applied to w gets us to an f of x, which is what we need to avoid. That's the end of my crash course. Ends of course. All right. So let's return to lenses and optics in general. Okay. So let's just begin by fixing a symmetric number. Here is our general definition of an optic, and immediately I'll show you how we get back to lenses. So, this definition is originally due to Castro and Street, although they were thinking of this stuff in a completely different context and didn't uh, didn't realize the connection to optics when they did. The 
called it an optic, or what they, they can call it? What do they call it? Um, they said there is this category. Okay. <laughs> they didn't give a name to the four physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so an optic from S to A is an element of the following kind. from S to M tensor A uh, and then a map in the other direction from M tensor A to back to S. So just like we saw uh, so in the example back there we were taking the coin in set, this is also <coughs> happening in set. Right? Um, although the, the index category is C but the, the target of this function is set. And these, these are going to correspond to uh, lenses, not necessarily lawful ones. Okay, so how do we get back to lenses? So, let's look at the category, uh, just some category with finite products. We can simplify this. So we've got the kind. Here we have a map into a product. So by the universal property of the product, we can split this into two pieces. This is the same as a map to M and a map to A. We still have this piece. Okay. Now, this comment here is exactly this shape over here for us to apply the Ninji enabler. So regular, close. So here we have some functor of F. And this is the bit left over that we need. So using unit reduction more or less the way to do it is you just, everywhere we see n in the functor, we just plug in s. We get a map from s to a, together with a map from s and a to s. These are exactly a pair of get and put. So uh, let's return to optics in general and how we should think about this comment here. So we're going to go back to that description of Cohen as a, a particular co-equalizer. I know it wasn't on the board quite long enough to internalized, but this is what it boils down to. An optic. Well, it's a pair of, uh, it's a pair of these two things, uh, it's a pair of maps, one on each side. So I'm just going to call the left piece L. pair of maps, but it's up to a particular equivalence relation. We're going to uh, identify some pairs of maps. So, when you boil down the relation that the coming is giving, it looks like this. The relation is going to tell us if we have some function or some morphism that we can just apply to M, the, the optic is agnostic about whether that function happens on the left side or the right side. So what this looks like is if we do L and then some morphism that just affects the end bit, 
and then the right side. This is the same optic as the one where we just do left side and then do the apply the F on the right side. So there's there's a very nice interpretation of optics that's written like this in terms of I'm sorry, is that a composition? Just that notation applied to L? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, this will be more clear with the picture. So, uh, in the language of string diagrams, we would write these two pieces something like this. Now, I'm um, sorry, my string diagram drawing is not very good. And the equivalence relation is telling us a certain thing. If we have an F, which we're applying on the left hand side, this is going to be the same as if we had done it on the right hand side. These are the same, we're going to consider these the same object. And one way of thinking about this is we have a string diagram which outputs an A and sort of continues on in this upper section and then takes A as an input and you know, recombines things. And there's a, there's a nice diagrammatic way of describing this, um, this relation, saying we're going to identify these diagrams. I'm going to draw a box around A to keep it distinct. It's saying we have some diagram with a hole that takes a, that has an output A and an input A, and it doesn't particularly matter where we vertically cut the, the diagram into two pieces. It's the same object. What's the move where you filled in the, the thing with the line above there? Does well, that mean something? Well, it, it's, well, the the way I'm thinking of it is uh, there's a diagrammatic move where you kind of slide things across and these are supposed to be the same optic anyway so it's kind of a cheap, I mean if, to be specific maybe we should also cut it vertically something like this but um, I, plugging in doesn't actually happen it, there is no actual like continuation of the M through the just check like this isn't this doesn't formally so follow this is, from yeah, something. This is, this is, well, I'm not actually composing the ends in any way. I'm uh -huh. not writing an equivalence class of optics um, in this convenient way. Okay. So what does composition, I mean, you haven't said that optics form a category, but what does composition right, about? I'm about to. So this, this is why this notation is so nice, I think. If we have, um, Way. If we have one of these and we have some other optic, which now brings us to uh, down to S, uh, so these are composable. Then, oh, I've got these backwards a bit. Um, if we want to compose these things, there's a space in this diagram for us to plug in something with an, out, uh, with an input of S and an output of S. So these things, uh, these things composed, well, so I've got the order backwards there, but it really does look like just plugging the, uh, this one into the hole of this one.
told you what composition is, I should also tell you what the identity is. Right. Okay. The identity would be a lens from, oh, an optic from A, A to A. And the way I would draw it is something like this. It's sort of like something that we can plug in for the whole of that that doesn't really change things. And, uh, I mean, here I'm cheating by sort of omitting a unit object the way we would probably write this carefully is, well, we're creating a unit object. And then, just on the other side. And with these, uh, so I've written these in diagram diagrammatic notation, but you can do it just through the um, calculus of ends and cones. These things form a category. situation from uh, a particular, uh, opting a particular situation to lenses. So we can chase this definition of composition through this isomorphism and we get exactly the ordinary composition of lenses. We sort of you know, do the isomorphism on both sides. Uh, so the one thing left to do is to talk about the laws. And this uh, Turns out we can write a general uh, definition of laws for a, a generic optic category. So there, there are some things that you might be tempted to to try when we have uh, definitions like this. We might say that an optic is lawful if we have two maps here. We might say that the uh, optic is lawful if they are mutual inverses, like if it's expressing an isomorphism between S and M tensor A. And there is an issue with that, which is that the, that property of being you know, mutual inverses is not preserved under this relation. It could be the case if we if maybe we get unlucky with the representative we have, and it's not an isomorphism. So it's a little bit more difficult to identify. Uh, another, uh, the next thing we might try is we might say that they're lawful if there's some representative for which it's an isomorphism. And this kind of works in the sense that uh, it, when, we, when we look at lenses in sets, then that notion of uh, lawfulness for an optic does correspond to lawfulness for in, in, the, in the lens sense. But from my perspective, that, from my perspective, that's kind of an accident in the sense that to get that proof to go through, we're using a bunch of other stuff about the category of sets. You need to you know the, uh, use the fact that sets has pullbacks and every non-empty set has a global element in the Things that don't feel very natural when we're trying to come up with a generic definition. Uh, so here's the, here's the definition of So, uh, so far I haven't given a name to the collection of optics. So I'll just say, let this be the set of optics from S to A. Uh, and we're also going to need another set, which I really need someone to tell me a better notation for this. This is terrible. I'm going to put a square thing there. Please forgive me. The, 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 the idea of the lens laws is something about using the lens more than once. 
So I'm going to define this odd set, which is kind of like two copies of this uh, set of optics glued together. So I'm going to look at this set. I'm going to take the cohen over two different ends. And the cohen is going to, uh, the interior of the cohen is the maps from S to M1 tensor A. M1 tensor A to M2 tensor A. And then finally, from M2 tensor A uh, back to S. So this is like that thing glued together. <clears throat> and uh, using these sets, we can define a motion of force. Uh, maybe I'll So given a generic optic, there's uh, at least one interesting thing we can do with it, which is given, uh, given any representative, we can compose across the two to get a map from S to itself. And uh, the way the relation works, it doesn't matter which, which representative we choose, we're going to get the same, uh, the same concept. Um, Now we'll bring the second set into play. It turns out there are two different ways to take a, a general optic and shove it into this set here. So the first one uses the optic once. So given an optic, we can send it to into this thing. And here's what it does. We have a map from S to N of A, which we can put into this component. We have a map from uh, yeah. oh, S to M tensor A. Here we have a map that uh, we can put a map M tensor A to S. So we've filled these two slots. And in the middle, what we need is a map from M tensor A to M tensor A. We supply the identity. So here we can left M tensor A, uh, the identity on M tensor A, right. But there's another thing we can do, which uses the optic twice. Which is just as before, in the first and third component, we can just put left and right. But now in the middle, uh, we need a map from n tensor A to n tensor A, and we can supply the round trip that goes through left and right. So here we've got left, uh, left and goes right, and right. So using these maps, I can now tell you what the notion of lawfulness for an optic is. An optic is lawful if, if we compose through the outside. We just get the identity on S, and using the optic once is the same as using it once. And the nice thing about this definition is that in the case of lenses, these conditions here give you precisely the three lens laws.
without needing any more conditions on the category, without needing any strange tricks to get put put to work or anything like that. These are when you uh, use more Cohen tricks on that thing, you get exactly the principles. So this is what convinces me that this is the right notion of lawfulness for optics in general. And uh, one thing I'm hoping to do is if we're looking at new examples of optics, these will guide us as to what the law should be rather than trying to guess. And uh, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Yes. Do these correspond, like does one of them correspond to one of them and the other one to the other two? Yes. Or yeah. So this outside one is um, using the get and then putting it back in. Right. So it's gone from the board now, but that was a map from S to S, and that's exactly what this is here. And then the other two laws uh, correspond to this equation. So uh, maybe I should have said just quickly, um, the way you check it for lenses is the same trick that we used over here to remove the coins from the situation up there. We just do the same tricks down here, and we get, like I think it's a collection of uh, three maps. Uh, this set collection to uh, this. This set corresponds to a collection of three explicit maps with no columns involved. One of them, like this, one of them ends up being just uh, get always. But then the other two being equal, one of them is is that is um, one of them is put get and the other one is. So, so are there any examples of lenses that aren't obviously pack some, take something out of the record or 